A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this 60th edition of the Together for Education webinars brought to you by Notebook. For the last so many months, we are almost at the end of the year, and this started way back in March. For nearly a year, it has been our privilege to play host to some of the most experienced educators and thought leaders from around the country, and sometimes even outside. We started this initiative in trying to help a lot of teachers, a lot of educators out there get more familiar with online learning tools. There was this new thing called a pandemic that was happening out there. Not a lot of us knew what to do about it. All we knew is that we were going into a lockdown. Schools were going to be closed, but schooling definitely had to go on. Since then, quite a bit has changed. Today, most of our educators and most of our students have become extremely conversant and experts in online learning. Products like Notebook have stepped in and helped millions of students find their solutions easily in the online space. However, one great change that happened during this time has been the new education policy. An unprecedented change in the way schooling has happened in India so far. Today, we discuss a very important aspect of the NEP 2020, the five plus three plus three plus four split of the education system. Well, tailoring sections of our schooling to the age appropriateness of our students has been something that has been at the core of the notebook design psyche. What I will do now is show you clips of three different notebook videos, three videos meant for three different age groups, and you will perhaps see the way we treat each of them differently when it comes to the art and treatment. Here's the small clip. Let's find out the footprint of the elephant. Yes, it's deep. Next, we can see a tiger. Where are the tiger's footprints? Yes, it's C. Where are the deer's footprints? Yes, it's E. Next, we can see a dog. Where are the dog's footprints? Bipin Chaudhary, or as he is fondly called, Bipin Babu, is a voracious reader. He needs to buy at least five books a week across a variety of genres. He especially prefers crime, thriller and ghost stories. He stops by Kali Charan's bookstore in Newmarket every Monday to pick them up. Hello students, welcome to Notebook. The churches and the clergy across Europe were influenced by the feudal culture of the times in its customs and social relationships. Well, as you just saw, when we teach students who are at a class two or a preparatory level, we make use of cartoonish drawings. These are very similar to drawings that they would see in their other picture books. These are also drawings that they can try to copy and emulate. When the student grows up a little, when we're talking to classes seven and eight, we adopt a more comic bookish look because that is perhaps the age where the comic books and illustrations are grabbing the attention of those students. Fast forward to classes 11 and 12, these students have now been exposed to YouTube, a lot of digital content and perhaps computer games. Therefore, there needs to be that sensibility built in. Also, the number of animation steps included and a whole lot of other design philosophies change with age. And this is how we at Notebook try to make sure that each of our video lessons are age appropriate. Well, that's a lot about us. And it is now time to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker today is Mr. Philip Barrett. Mr. Barrett retired as the deputy headmaster from the illustrious Dune School in Dehradun after 44 years of serving in education across various institutions. Mr. Barrett served the Dune School as housemaster, head of department, Dean of Student Welfare, Dean of Activities, Deputy Headmaster, Second Master, and Acting Headmaster with great distinction. He also carried out a visioning exercise for the Dune School in the year 2011 through an in-depth study of a number of British public schools and various schools in the US. Mr. Barrett qualified as a leadership trainer at Wellington College UK in the year 2000. He's also an athlete, an adventurer, and a naturalist, and also somebody who has just just turned 68, just a couple of days ago. Sir, a belated happy birthday to you and over to you. Thank you very much, Shubayu. I hope I am audible and visible. Yes, sir, loud and clear and clearly visible. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you very much for your birthday wishes. You're rubbing in my age, I know, uh, 68. Uh, I'm feeling as old as I am. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much for that introduction. And a very good evening to Achin, Abhishek, the entire Notebook team, and uh, Dr. Chakravarti and Mrs. Natarajan, who are on our panel, and all those great people who have tuned in this evening. Um, I do not profess to know too much about this topic because um, I need to go into it in depth. It's a very, very cumbersome, long um, policy. But when you distill the um, essence of it and you shift, uh, you sift the grain from the chaff, it's a very good policy on the whole. Uh, it is the implementation of this policy that was, is going to cause some, uh, some degree of hassle. Um, you know, uh, this policy has come after almost 40 years. And I remember um, being in training college at Bombay uh, when we studied the Kothari Commission report. So it's, it's actually a long time coming. And um, when it did come in last year, a lot of my friends who are headmasters in the teaching profession uh, were, very, were, were very worried. It sent uh, shock waves through the teaching community because you know we teachers generally tend to get used to something and we don't like change. Um, and I know a lot of my friends were very worried about what's going to happen to textbooks and what's going to happen to classes and teacher training, etc. But the more I read about this policy, the more I am convinced that it is a good policy at the end. Now, with regard to the new pedagogical structure, there's been an emphasis on early learning and childhood development. Hence, the earlier 10 plus 2 structure has given way to the 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 structure. And this corresponds to the ages 3 to 8, 8 to 11, 11 to 14, 14 to 18. Now, I was doing a little research and looked at various similar um, pedagogical structures in China, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Mexico, some Latin American countries, as well as European countries. And more or less, give and take a year, a year here and there, all these policies, all these structures have a similarity, especially in the middle and in the secondary stages. They all go from about 11 to 12 to 17, 18, before the higher education starts. But where we are slightly different is we are getting very formal at the early age of three. Now, what, what this policy really has is it brings in to the hitherto neglected age bracket three to six, it brings it under a curriculum. And this is an age recognized to be very crucial to a child's cognitive development. Now, <clears throat> today a student enters by the age of three, he joins a school and he moves through play class, pre-KG, KG, um, mother and child, tiny tots, up to kindergarten. Then class one and two is followed by 12 years of secondary and higher secondary education. Now the education policy, the new education policy, will divide the same structure to coincide with the cognitive development stages, which is early childhood, school years, and secondary education. Now, to the question, when does a child start school in India? One will get different answers. Up to now, there was no fixed answer. And how many years are play, pre-nursery, nursery, up to the time a child reaches class one, again, is very, very dubious. It differs from state to state and from within a state, from school to school sometimes. Now the new structure will, for me, will sort this muddle. And we start at three and do three years of primary education. Of these three years, uh, these first three years will be done maybe outside major schools, but in an Anganwadi system. And this will be followed by 10 years of schooling. Now, is this a bad thing or a good thing? I don't know. On the one hand, sometimes I feel it is too young for children to be forced into a structured curriculum. And we are such a diverse country, from the Northeast to the Deep South, from Uttarakhand, my state, to Rajasthan. They will be all doing the same central curriculum. There are so many different socioeconomic groups. Will the poor farmer's st son study the same as an Ambani's grandson? Now, there are also very different needs to be met. Will the children of a farmer 
have the same primary education as somebody who wants to become an engineer and go abroad. An artist, a potential artist, will he do the same curriculum as somebody who wants to be, you know, a potter? Now, on the one hand, there's great confusion in my mind, having taught only above class eight, what age children should join school. And I wonder at the plethora of tiny nurseries and kindergartens tucked away in these residential areas, scooped up over shops, which take in little children and cram them into little rooms. Sometimes I feel the new education policy will solve all this problem. Now, if you look at the, <clears throat> the, the chart that Shubayu has put up there, it's very simple. It's very, it's very, very, uh, very simplified chart. You have the foundation stages in two parts. Part A, just three years of preschooling. Part B, two of two years of formal schooling, which coincides with grade one and two. And this covers ages three to eight. Then you have the preparatory stage, which is three years of schooling, coinciding with grades three to five, covering ages eight to 11. Then you have the middle stage, three years again, coinciding with grades six and six to eight, covering ages 11 to 40. And finally, a secondary stage, again broken into two parts, part A, grades nine and 10, covering ages 14 to 60, and part B, grades 11 and 12, covering ages 16 to 18. Now, where I think there should be a little bit of a bifurcation is in the 11 and 12, I would suggest that there should be a, there should be a choice that a student makes, whether he goes into a purely academic physics, maths, English, history stream, or if he goes into a vocational stream, which means you know tourism, journalism, something creative, something vocational, like a technical school. And in Brazil, that happened. You can choose a class at, at the end of class 10, whether you want to go into academics or you want to go into careers. Some of the important things about the this new um, pedagogical structure is the assessment reforms. And I think India needs this. Our system of assessment, which has hitherto been based on rote learning and cramming and marks, this is going to change. There's going to be a totally redesigned national assessment center. And the aim of this assessment will be to test for core competencies. I don't think an employer is getting the best um, best person for his factory or his job when you look at marks. I think there's much more to a student than the marks he brings. I think we are going to have to move from a summative to a formative type of assessment. The second thing that this does, this whole policy does is the assess the, the, the holistic, it's a kind of very holistic curriculum. And, you know, we are going to have um, <clears throat> physical education, health and nutrition, well-being, together, rubbing shoulders with maths, coding, problem solving, creative thinking, as well as AI, design, leadership, good citizenship. I think this is going to be a rich curriculum if you get all this together. Also, there's a lot that this says about English being important and the link language, as well as teaching and learning in the vernacular. I think while it's not compulsory, it is highly recommended. And each state will have to figure out its own way forward because it is based on a very, very secure foundation that children grasp best in their mother tongue. <clears throat> then there is also um, <clears throat> uh, a big stress on the foundation skills in literacy and numeracy. That is why they're starting, they're starting the formal education at the age of three. There's a national mission on literacy and numeracy, which will be set up by the education ministry, and it will benefit children from quite an early age. Another thing is the there is no sharp divide between science and arts. And this is what I think our current system suffers from. You know, kids are divided into the commerce stream, the arts stream, and the science stream. And that, I think, leaves our scientists lacking in the humanities. Our humanities students don't have any idea of science. And our poor commerce students start careers from the age of nine, and they lose out on both the scientific temper 
as well as the artistic, you know, the way of looking at things. I much prefer a scientist who's also read Shakespeare and literature. And I also prefer uh, um, a, scient uh, um, uh, a man of letters, a humanitarian, who also has a scientific temper. So <clears throat> this no divide between these, the, 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 the various streams is a very good idea. Much more freedom has been left to the students to select their own subject combinations. In fact, in the last two years, as I said, there should be a branching off into careers and vocation studies, as well as into academics. And uh, <clears throat> another thing is that this system speaks very well of the inclusion and equality of all. The government plans to get everybody into schools and you know, get that truancy figure falling. Now, this whole policy, this whole structure looks excellent on paper. And I think we've got a few years you got up to 2023 to, to figure it out and streamline it and, and, and uh, you know, dovetail it with other things. I just hope it works. Only time will tell um, how, how, how good it uh, looks on paper. Um, I think, as I said, it is with the, it's, it's with the cooperative effort of schools, teachers, good feedback, and an open mind, I think we can go forward on this policy. Thank you very much, Subayu, and I look forward to the views of our esteemed panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, when you started by saying that this is not a topic that you know about, I, I, I think all of us now know that you are clearly joking. Well, I think after that wonderful introduction, it is now time to move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Ochin Bhattacharya. Ochin is the founder and CEO at Notebook. A chartered accountant by training, Ochin was a director at Deloitte prior to starting Notebook. He has worked in India and abroad in various senior capacities in GE, PwC, KPMG, and Deloitte. He is a fellow of the ICAI and a member of CP Australia. He is also the recipient of the prestigious Indian Achievers Award. Ochin is an avid reader and a passionate traveler with keen interests in economics, history, literature, and philosophy. He is a regular speaker at various forums and chambers of commerce and also contributes articles to numerous publications regularly. He is also on the board of some of the most renowned corporates and contributes significantly to their brand strategies. Ochin, over to you. Good evening, everyone. Shivaya, am I audible? Audible and visible, Ochin. Go for it. I once again welcome all of you to today's session on a topic which is not only important but very contemporary. I think one of the most discussed topic across academic circles around the country. 30 years ago, against the backdrop of a changing world order, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the decline of apartheid, the birth of the World Wide Web, the world united in defense of children and childhood. While most of the world's parents at the time had grown up under dictatorships or falling governments, they hoped for better lives, greater opportunities, and more rights for their children. So when leaders came together in 1989, in a moment of rare global unity, to make a historic commitment to the world's children to protect and fulfill their rights, there is a real sense of hope for the next generation. The children of today are facing a new set of challenges and global shifts that were unimaginable to their parents. For instance, our climate is changing beyond recognition. Inequality is increasing every day. Technology is transforming how we perceive the world and more families are migrating than ever before. Childhood has changed and we need to change our approaches along with it. So as we look back on 30 years of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, we should also look ahead to the next 30 years. We must listen to today's children and young people about the issues of greatest concern to them. 
and as a society begin working on 21st century solutions to 21st century problems and digital innovations can help us do more i was reading about something very interesting the other day which i wanted to share with all of you a concept called learning passport i i really found this very interesting and insightful and value adding as well unicef is collaborating with microsoft and the university of cambridge to develop a learning passport now what what is this passport all about it's a digital platform that will facilitate learning opportunities for children and young people within and across borders the learning passport is being tested and piloted in countries hosting refugees migrants and internally displaced person you know children young adults who are losing out on conventional education a digitally inclusive world should allow young people no matter the situation to get access to education so irrespective of where children are children who are being displaced civil unrest war moving across borders refugees but learning continues education is unhindered if not in conventional sense at least digital thus scaling up solutions like the digital learning passport would help millions of displaced children gain the skills they need to thrive i really found this very interesting so i just thought of sharing this before we come to today's topic and if you look at numbers today there are more than 1.8 billion young people between the ages of 10 and 24 across the globe 1.8 billion one of the largest cohorts in human history now very often they lack access they lack access to an education that will prepare them for contemporary jobs and business opportunities we need to we need to empower them with skills and outlook they need for a 21st century economy if you look at if you look at events global events last 30 years how economies have shaped up the relative income inequality between countries has definitely reduced there's no doubt about it you know globalization has its own share of positive impacts but absolute income inequality has increased significantly so that some children and families with low income are left behind and miss out on the opportunities that their rich peers enjoy moreover mobility has stalled over last 30 years so another generation in a poverty trap determined <clears throat> determined entirely by the family he or she is born into as we all know the children of today are adults of tomorrow their growth is parallel to the future of any country and thus the importance of education system needs no further deliberation it's 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 a normal education system is all encompassing it's the most important thing a school for instance must stimulate curiosity in the young impressionable minds and equip them with tools to be better human beings thus with this background when we see education system and when we see the importance and the magnitude of of the challenges the plethora of challenges that policy makers citizens are facing with this background and in the light of these challenges when we examine a new policy and the changes it assures the changes it brings in for instance when we discuss about the recent the new pedagogical and curricular restructuring topic of today's deliberation 
So as we're all aware, that currently children in the age group of three to six were not covered in 10 plus two structure. As classes, and when we, and when we say not covered, I mean, by and large, not covered. So we, we discussed about the entire country, all state boards, all children. So everyone was not covered, is the right way to put it. So class one normally begin at, class, at the age of six. Yes, preschools were there. And definitely some children were availing it. But everyone was not fortunate enough. In the new five plus three plus three plus four structure, a strong base of you know, early childhood care and education. So that's the terminology that policymakers are trying to bring in, ECCE. And from the age of three, it aims to promote better overall learning, development, and well being. So the objective is to make the entire school system, the entire school education, to, re to reconfigure it and make it more responsive and relevant. So as to cater to interest of learners, cater to the developmental needs at different stages. Now, if you look at the four stages, you know, to start with foundation stage, covering ages three to eight, divided into two parts. So five years of flexible, multi-level activity-based learning. Now, that will be followed by preparatory stage, covering grades three to five, ages eight to eleven. So these three years, what is the what is the basic objective? Like each stage has its own objective. In preparatory preparatory stage, the objective is the the focus is the emphasis is on play, activity based, pedagogical and curricular style of learning, on discovery. So from foundation. The child proceeds to preparatory and then comes middle stage, which is grades 6 to 8. So normally covering ages around 11 to 14. So in these three years, the objective is to build on skills and competencies developed in the preparatory stage. But with one exception, very important exception, something new comes in at this stage. And what is that? The introduction of subject teachers for learning and discussion of each subject, subjects like science, mathematics, arts, social science, humanities that are being introduced at this stage and experiential learning within each subject. So the objective is to ensure that children are encouraged, experiential learning is encouraged within each subject. So next stage from foundation to preparatory to middle school and next comes secondary stage, classes nine to 12, covering roughly approximately like, you know, around ages 14 to 18. So as we have, this will consist of four years of multidisciplinary study, especially classes 11 and 12. And this will again build on the subject oriented pedagogical and curricular style of middle stage. So each stage aims to build on core competencies developed in the previous stage, but with greater depth, more critical thinking, more flexibility in terms of choice of subject, the words I mentioned, and also greater attention to life aspirations, which I think is very important. Now, out of this four stage, of course, I look forward to hear the views of our eminent panel that we have today. I think I would like to focus more on the first stage, which I guess is very important. And this is something new that the policy brings in. Now, coming to first stage, the foundation stage, which the policy makers very appropriately term as early childhood care and education, ECCE. Now, as we are all aware that more than 85% of a child's brain development occurs prior to the age of six. So this clearly indicates the importance of appropriate care 
and stimulation in early formative years. So presently, children from socioeconomically disadvantaged background do not have access to early childhood care and education. So everyone is not fortunate enough to have elementary school, get that care. Thus, if we are able to provide universally this early childhood care, and the policy is quite ambitious, you know, 2030 has been mentioned as a date that not later than 2030. So that's the cutoff. To ensure that all children who are entering grade one from 2030 are school ready. So basically the aim is to ensure that in this early childhood care, flexible, multi-level, play-based, activity-based, you know, learning which comprise of numbers, counting, colors, shapes, alphabets, languages, puzzles, problem solving, and also activities like, for instance, visual art, craft, drama, music, logical thinking. Thus, and also, I, I understand there's a very strong focus, and I find this one really interesting. And very, very value adding as well. Focus on social capabilities. The policy specifically mentions that the aim is not only to develop skills with regard to reading and writing, but also on developing social capabilities in terms of good behavior, courtesy, hygiene, you know, things like ethics, teamwork, cooperation. So I guess these are values which once inculcated a lifelong assets. And naturally, early formative years are the best time to inculcate and nurture these values. Thus, the overall aim of ECC will be to attain optimal outcomes in the domain of cognitive development, uh, physical and motor development, I guess cultural development in terms of artistic pursuits, developing early language, communication, literacy, numeracy. So all these are lifelong skills, you know, if you're able to effectively utilize this, this initial formative years, it will go a very long way to ensure success. The policy also aspires to develop a national framework and this will be developed by NCRT. For children up to age of eight years, this framework again will be divided into two parts. First framework is Abhishek, I'm not sure if it's a drop at my end, but uh, we, I can't hear Achin and his video seems to be stuck. I think we're facing a bit of a connection issue. Just give us just a couple of seconds and we'll get Achin right back on the line. Achin, you're on mute. I Hello. think we lost you for the last few seconds. Uh, better now? Yeah, better. Okay. Thanks. Okay now? Yeah. One second. Okay. So we were discussing about the goal. So goal is to ensure that, you know, aspirational districts, socioeconomically disadvantaged areas be given special attention and priority. So that every child gets opportunity, every child gets access to early childhood care and education. Second is after goal, next we come to the delivery aspect. So how will this be delivered? So this task is a mammoth task, right? We're discussing about, about, about a huge country, which is a continent in itself. 
so with regard to delivery also i find the policy has gone a step ahead and discuss about the delivery part uh, but it's also means delivery through a uh, stand alone anganwadis anganwadis which are you know co located with primary schools pre primary schools stand alone pre schools and also recruitment of teachers has been specifically mentioned for early childhood care and education which is really important you know training teachers recruiting them with this pedagogy so after discussing about the goal and the delivery mechanism there is another important aspect which i wanted to discuss and i guess this one is really important and and this mid day meal program seven day mid day meal program shall also be extended to preparatory classes in primary schools so this will really help in bringing children you know to school and help in the nourishment as well which of course is a welcome initiative the policy also discusses about health checkups and monitoring which in some form or fashion is already available for anganwadi system so how to extend it to preparatory class students and primary class students so see it's a all encompassing policy all factors have been discussed not only in terms of pedagogy but aspects like the goal of the policy the implementation of the policy children's nutrition in the form of mid day meal program health so it's all in comes in comes the policy also another important aspect you know terminology discussed in the policy is the concept of bal vatika it is it is envisaged that prior to the age of 5 every child will move to a preparatory class now this preparatory class has been named as balwatika and it's mandatory that before a child starts class 1 in preparatory he or she goes to this preparatory class mechanism and teachers will teach there every preparatory school pre school needs to have an ecce qualified teacher early childhood care and education qualified teacher so i guess uh, this i were some very important and interesting aspects another another thing when i was uh, going through this policy and uh, looking at it from a more holistic perspective with regard to where the requirement comes from so when we when i started my deliberation we discussed about uh, things from a global perspective but even if you look at things from a national perspective which i guess is the need of the hour equally important right now the ability to read and write and perform basic calculations etc we all know is is indispensable right it's a prerequisite for for any schooling however various government surveys and non government surveys if you look at whether you look at uh, isa surveys you look at pratham assess surveys indicate that currently we are in a learning crisis and when i say learning crisis i mean the country as a whole there are challenges of course a lot of good work has happened but still there are a lot of challenges as well now a large proportion of students who are currently in elementary school and numbers are around more than 5 crore have not attained basic literacy and numeracy that is ability to read and write or the ability to carry on like basic arithmetic operations like subtraction addition etc so these are challenges right and there's no doubt about it that the highest any education system if you look at the highest priority has to be achieving universal foundation literacy and numeracy in primary schools so the policy specifically sets 2025 as a year when we as a nation aim to achieve this achieve when is achieve this achieve universal foundation literacy and rest of the policy so when i say rest of the policy like aspects like choice of subjects uh, aspects like higher education will only be relevant if these basic learning requirements 
like for instance skills like reading writing arithmetic is first achieved there's no doubt about it unless until the basics are strong enough unless until the basic requirements are met naturally any any high level thinking any aspiration will hit a roadblock hence i guess this foundation part is really very important and this is the need of the hour the policy also discusses about an about an existing platform called diksha i'm sure many of you are already aware as esteemed educators most of you are aware so this national repository of high quality resources which already exists diksha the policy aims to make it more available for foundation literacy and numeracy as well so that means content with regard to foundation literacy will be made available in diksha it also discusses about technological intervention now technological interventions using technology as an aid to help bridge any barrier say for example language barrier geographic barrier and the policy also another very important aspect which i found you know uh, one of my favorite topics long lost subjects it discusses about libraries to so build a culture of reading across the country which i think is very important and considering the current pandemic considering the current situation and practicalities a lot of emphasis has been given on digital libraries you know making libraries digital which will naturally ensure universal access so a lot of i find uh, find this quite insightful the intent is firmly in place and not only the policy discusses about things at a thousand feet level but also it goes to implementation and tries to tick check box in all different areas be it health nutrition you know in uh, goal of the policy future roles etc so these are some aspects which i wanted to discuss i thank all of you for giving me a patient hearing and i really look forward to the deliberation of the panel with regard to their thoughts on this which i think is a very contemporary topic thank you over to you shubhai thank you achin uh, although we had a bit of a signal issue today i think that was a wonderful presentation and very well received as well well ladies and gentlemen it is now time to introduce our panelists for the day as we are tr trying to crack the code of 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 we have with us today dr arunima chakravorty who is the principal of the delhi public school in bhagalpur and also the founder principal at dps greater rachi she is also the secretary of the vb college of education and was state coordinator for nta 2019 and city coordinator for ctet 2019 she is an advisory board member of international journal of 360 degree management review she keeps a faith in developing transformational humanistic and transactional leadership leading to capacity building in society she did an advanced leadership program from judge business school cambridge university in the uk and she holds a phd in integrated pest management ipm research part indian institute of sciences bangalore she holds a masters in microbiology special paper geo gold medalist she held, she completed her bachelor's in zoology chemistry botany where she held a first class first with distinction she also has a bachelor's in education and her schooling was from aiss cbsc and aiss cbsc she was awarded the gold medal by guwahati university for securing first class first position in msc and bsc examinations the indian academy of sciences awarded her a fellowship and she worked on phylogenetic analysis and intraspecific variability of vam using rapd markers she has been awarded the outstanding leader of the year award 2019 by american college of dubai at dubai the active principal award by indira gandhi rashtriya gyan peet for outstanding performance of students the ideal principal award by akhil bhartiya nagarik vikas kendra the outstanding school leader award at indian education awards 2017 an excellence in school leadership award 2016 at school leadership summit by elets media she was awarded nari today award 2017 and woman of courage by jagran and inex publishing houses ma'am it's our privilege to have you with us today we also have uh, with us I... Ms. yes ma'am yeah please sorry ma'am uh, we also have with us ms ganga natrajan who's the principal of san academy in kamakoti nagar chennai a veteran educationist with 27 long years of experience in school administration mrs ganga natrajan is the principal of that school 
The school represents her holistic, progressive approach to education and her constant endeavor to provide various educational opportunities to everyone. She is a postgraduate in economics and holds a professional degree in finance. She has been conferred with the most prestigious award, Best Teacher Award, by CBSC South Cluster and Lions Club for a valuable and dynamic support to the student community. San Academy, under her leadership, has been conferred with K 12's Best School Award in 2019, the International School Award in 2019, and Teaching Excellence Award in 2020. Her prime endeavor is pursuit of excellence, and she joyfully strives for the same in all that she does. She leaves no stone unturned to venture into newer and challenging pedagogic territories in a bid to nurture pupils with etiquettes, social graces, moral values, and a deep love for our culture, ensuring holistic development and academic excellence. Her perpetual aim is to groom a perfect generation and to fully develop their innate potential in the present competitive world. Her collaborative leadership focuses on strategic actions directed towards improvement in the learning environment. It empowers employees, encourages board participation in decision making, and fosters shared accountability for student learning. Ma'am, thank you so much for joining. Privileged to have you with us today. I will now stop the share and uh, start my camera so that we can all see each other and start the discussion for today. Good evening, Dr. Chakraborty. I'm so sorry, uh, I cut you off midway. Ma'am, you're on mute. No, no, it's okay. I, I mean... <laughs> Ma'am, thank you so much for joining us back. I remember having yeah. you previously for another session. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, if we can come to you first for your opening thoughts about today's topic. Yeah. Uh, good evening to all the panelists and uh, good evening to all of you present here and special thanks. I would like to take this platform to thank uh, Team Notebook for their continuous commitment to a series of national level webinars that uh, are being conducted to ensure that all the stakeholders in education are kept informed of the latest trend in online education, the changes in the education policy, and how to implement these solutions at a very uh, minimal cost and how to cope with the transition in a pre-COVID uh, new education system in India. Uh, now the uh, new education policy 2020 is in place and uh, is very much needed. It was very much needed to overhaul the uh, existing uh, education system and uh, it looks to encourage high standards while keeping the schooling and the university teaching rooted to the Indian values and culture. Uh, if we look very closely to the NEP, there are two approaches to it. One is pedagogy and the other is curriculum. So in the pedagogical uh, viewpoint, it forces it as a development of uh, skills and competence. Either the focus uh, was more where earlier, it was more on scoring of marks by just mastering the content. Now I think there would be a paradigm shift on mastering the competences of the child, which will pave the way to critical thinking, uh, their cognitive development, their application, and will develop the innate potential with a 360 degree assessment policy that I feel will be in place. Now, to me, the above pedagogical approach with the enable platform, I feel is also the foundation of smart learning to become so that we enable our uh, smarter citizens, the citizen of tomorrow. The uh, five plus three plus three plus four uh, system of education, which was now uh, introduced by the comment on the 29th of July, 2020, now, it seems to be at par with the need of the hour. Why I say so? Uh, because uh, though the number of years spent by the children in the earlier education system and with the new education system remains the same, but it comes with the inclusion of the preschool in the foundation stage. Now, this preschool was previously a part of the informal uh, education system. As Mr. Achin has already spoken, uh, I would like to you know, repeat uh, it again. The NCRT, uh, they have already started designing and developing. Uh, me, I was a part of 
one of the uh, development of syllabus uh, a year back, the national curricular and pedagogical framework for early childhood care and education. Now, uh, this is done in two phases and this will be for children within eight years of age. Now, uh, the pedagogues and even the practitioners, you know, alike, they have agreed to the importance of uh, early childhood care and education, that is ECCE, and uh, its role in shaping the child's future. So, including uh, or inclusion of pre-primary within the ambit of the uh, new education policy is probably the biggest win of NEP. Uh, now we see in NEP also, uh, there are uh, school examinations. Now this will be held in classes three, five and eight, and uh, this will be uh, addressed by the uh, school authorities itself. But the board examination uh, still persists in class 10 and 12. But uh, I feel with the new education policy, they will have leisure states and uh, more stress will be given to the holistic upbringing of the students like they are their uh, education now will not be compartmentalized you know, it will not be in the in compartments the assessment uh, will also be very comprehensive and i think technology will be used in a larger way uh, and we are already using it and we shall use more of artificial intelligence to show the learning outcome of the children uh, the shortcomings and what corrective measures are required for each individual student. Now, uh, in my previous talk, I always talk about flipped classroom education. So I feel uh, with the online classes and beyond that, flipped classroom is the need of the hour. You know, as students would love to do much in the classrooms uh, if they have a pre-knowledge of the subject before them. You know, and uh, this will also help them to develop conceptual understanding and uh, procedural fluency of professional educators and somewhat flip classroom. Uh, I, I try to, and I'm sure trying to incorporate in the schools where I work as event director principals, because I myself feel that this flip learning uh, should be engaged from lower classes and uh, that will also uh, help to uh, develop the cognitive level of the children. So at home, children will have knowledge and comprehension of a subject. And while they come at school, they uh, do the same thing with their application, their analysis, their synthesis, and then evaluating the learning. Uh, the National uh, Education Technology Forum that uh, is said to be as NETF, if I'm, I think I'm uh, correct on that uh, abbreviation, uh, it has also been created now where the e-courses will be developed and the process have already started uh, developing it in the regional languages because language will be a very important factor in the primary level in the foundation level uh, uh, in one of my papers uh, uh, when i was delivering at IIT delhi uh, there i wrote about the countries where they had a vernacular medium of uh, instruction at the lower level now when we have a vernacular medium of instruction of uh, at the lower level children are able to grasp on uh, the concept very uh, vividly and then if the basis or the foundation is uh, you know strong i think the pillars would definitely be strong and the child would uh, have you know good quality basic education so uh, i believe uh, that uh, this will be uh, very much uh, helpful uh, in making the children learn at the uh, foundation level in the use of vernacular language. Uh, 
And uh, there are even some countries where the students, I would mention here, uh, there are students where they go to those countries, the foreign students, they also have to take uh, learning lessons of that language of the country so that they can understand the country where they go for their studies or their work in a much better way. So I think language to me is uh, a very, very uh, crucial factor and crucial thing which has been taken into consideration in the new national education policy. Uh, I also believe that uh, uh, it is a very excellent way for the education industry to look forward to make changes for future learners. Uh, because by adapting to the policies, we are making the future of these children as future forward. That is, we are more futuristic with the new educational policy. And uh, here importance is also being given to skill development, to vocational learning and the introduction of internships uh, from class six onwards, which all of us, which will help, we know that, build the student's career path. Now, inclusion of uh, skill learning, for example, coding is a major initiative, you know, uh, which uh, is required to prepare everyone for future ready uh, 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 job market because by, uh, by uh, this coding classes with the children, now they're understanding how to do programming, how to do apps and, you know, before they knew only how to use it, now they know how to create it. So now they are becoming creatives. So inclusion of uh, the skill learning like coding is a major initiative and uh, I sincerely believe that it will prepare everyone for a future ready by acquiring the 21st century skills. Now it also aims to empower uh, children so that they are viewing themselves as creators. So when they uh, view themselves as creators rather than only you know, uh, using the applications uh, uh, their learning becomes future forward. And that is what is required. And uh, the inclusion of the vocational training with internship it will also provide uh, them with uh, real exposure and this will help them with their interest. Uh, yet another factor, uh, I think, uh, which will help the students uh, in uh, the different aspects of themselves is the transformational shift is the transformational shift of the assessment now from uh, a mark based uh, now it is rote learning not understanding you are just the children are cramming going back to school and just writing uh, the answers rather than that it has to be a holistic evaluation of the child the child should be uh, able to fit to the job market when they pass out of their college years. Uh, though it is not relevant here, the college education also has seen a change. It's now a four-year degree course. You can leave uh, in between if you want or to have only a diploma course. Why I am stating that this is because the children are prepared at the school level. So in the school level, if they are prepared with their vocational, uh, uh, you know, and uh, skill learning, uh, classes, then that will help them to understand their, uh, what are their uh, basic, you know, what they are more interested into. And uh, this will help them to create a better future. So to me, I feel the uh, national education policies uh, uh, has a lot of, it was very much needed. Uh, we needed it in India and uh, I think it would be a total holistic uh, learning for the children. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank, Thank you for that uh, wonderful encapsulation of this very complicated education policy, to be very honest. Because first time I read through the document, I was in the middle of water. It, it took me yeah. quite a few readings to understand what it actually meant. Uh, ma'am, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Natarajan, if we can come to you, ma'am, for your opening remarks before I get on to the questions. Okay, so uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am, loud and clear. Loud and clear, okay. So very, very uh, good evening to everyone. And uh, thank you, Mr. Shabayu, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Thank you so much. 
Um, yeah, I think uh, we have uh, uh, spoken a lot about uh, the policy as such, the national education policy. And uh, uh, I think by and large, uh, we have been able to understand the policy in a clear way. I think over so many uh, sessions which we have attended webinars and workshops on uh, NEP. CBSE is also conducting a lot of workshops for uh, leaders and teachers to understand the policy in a better way. I think uh, more than understanding the policy, we need to understand uh, the implementation part. So I always feel that if we are very clear about how we are going to implement the suggestions given by uh, the NEP, I think that is where the challenge lies. So uh, that will be my opening remarks. So I would directly go on to my question because I don't want to be uh, repeating the same thing. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I think all our speakers have been elaborately discussing on the policy as such. So you can directly shoot your question to me. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, my first question to you, and before I get onto the questions, fair warning, I typically play the role of the devil's advocate. So I am going to assume everything about the policy is wrong and you are welcome to prove me wrong. <laughs> uh, whenever we have worked abroad, right? Whenever we have interacted with people with other education systems, one of yeah. the things that have already always stood out is we have an education system that is more enriching in terms of width. The number of subjects I learned while reading and the number of topics I learned while studying in school have always helped me. Now, besides the five plus three plus three plus four structure, the new policy also reduces the amount of content at every stage. Do you not think that this will also decrease the exposure of students to a multitude of topics? So, um, see, in my opinion, actually, this is a very debatable topic. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a very debatable question. But anyway, so what happens generally, I will tell you in a school scenario, uh, the moment we talk about uh, reduced content, uh, there'd be a lot of, uh, you know, um, unrest among the teachers. Because if you go to a teacher who is about, say, 20 years of experience and tell her that from the next year, we're going to reduce the content. And uh, no, you have to, uh, we have to do a lot of activities and it should be activity-based learning and all that. You know, immediately she will say, no, 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 ma'am, it cannot be done because the children will not have their basics strong. And same thing, if you're going to pose the same question to a teacher, a new teacher, I will say, a teacher who is just about, say, four or five years of experience, I think they will, they will jump into this idea because uh, it, that's the way now teaching has to be. So we are looking at, uh, of course, uh, there are a lot of changes which has already uh, happening in all in the, in the curriculum. It has been revised a lot, and we are already in the right path of what NEP is expecting uh, school education to be. And I think in my opinion, uh, it's, it's not going to be uh, very difficult for to convince a teacher of that 20 year to come into this kind of a setup where we can, uh, as our other speakers said, it's going to be experiential learning and holistic development of a child. So if you, uh, so times have changed and so do we. So in the current scenario of education, it's very important to face the world and teach him why he is just a minute. Teach him why he is learning what he, uh, the concepts uh, and how he is going to implement this in his day-to-day -day life is what we are looking at in the present you know, way of education. In the early, yes, of course, concept learning is very, very important. Only then he will be able to apply. But how we are going to make children learn these concepts is what the methodology is what we are looking at in NEP. So the new policy rightly says that we are paying emphasis on this aspect and the curriculum to be adapted and developed is aimed to be more skill-based. And gone are these days where universities and top companies are caring about the academic scores alone. Uh, it's a great thing that the government has realized that shift in the global, global education. I think bring it, we are bringing it home to our Indian students and it has been very well uh, I will say conceived and put across in the NEP. And according to the national education policy, the school curriculum and the pedagogy will aim at the holistic development of learners, equipping them for the 21st century skills. 
It also additionally focusing at a reduction of syllabus uh, to enhance essential learning and critical thinking. So a teacher, when she's delivering the content, uh, she has to look at the 360 degrees of the concept. And uh, 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 like, since I'm heading a CBSC school, I think CBSC is a very progressive board and we are already have, have already started implementing uh, the various things which NEP has uh, been focusing on uh, because we have already introduced uh, art integration in our curriculum. We have introduced sports as a very, very important uh, tool in curriculum. Uh, CBSC is very particular that every, every day there should be one period for physical activity. I think that's a, it's a very progressive board. And uh, though, of course, in the initial stages when CBSE came up with all these changes, uh, there was a little bit of uh, restlessness. And uh, even as a leader, I felt like, how can I give one PT period every day? It is not possible. And we are compromising on uh, other subject uh, class. But uh, now after introdu introduction of uh, the art education and the sports period every day, uh, we are seeing a big difference in, in the child's development. Uh, children who are uh, more uh, sports oriented or children who are more art oriented, they are showing interest. And then when they are integrating this art integration into various subjects, I think learning is really happening as uh, we are seeing that difference over the years now, uh, two, three years, uh, we are able to see a big difference in the learning of uh, you know, the, the content. And it also gives room for inquiry-based inquiry learning, discovery-based, discussion-based. Uh, I will uh, like to quote when we had the CCA system in CBSC some few years back, recently we have done away with it. But uh, when the system was introduced, uh, we were wondering how we are going to do this because we were generally doing a chalk and board uh, uh, teaching and you know giving the classwork and then testing them exam after exam. But when CC was introduced and they said, you should do dramatics, you should do role play, and uh, you have to do project-based learning and uh, give them um, you know, a lot of activities and then assess them through that and give grades. Mm, initially, yeah, we did feel that it was a very big change for us. But when we got into the real essence of this uh, CC pattern, uh, we really enjoyed, as teachers, we enjoyed, as students, the children enjoyed, and we were able to see a big difference. A child who was not academically strong, uh, when we were introducing uh, these activities, he was very good. He was very good at doing an art activity or he was very good in acting. So he felt, yeah, I could do something. So I think uh, all these uh, pays way for a child's uh, self-confidence and children are, have become uh, a lot more outspoken nowadays. Now they are ready for to face the world. So I think uh, we are moving in the right direction of the NEP. And this, I think reduced content is, uh, should not uh, you know, be a very big concern for anybody at this point of time. Because even if we are able to say focus on 80% of content of what we were doing earlier, I think if we are able to do it uh, with all these activities and uh, all these different uh, ways of learning. I'm sure the content is being delivered to the child and child is able to use that knowledge in his future, in his life. And uh, I would also uh, uh, like to say that the NEP has made it very, very clear uh, to close the gap in achievement. And uh, uh, I will say the gap in learning, the learning outcomes. And uh, rather than pressurizing children with huge content and the exams. I think experiential learning of concepts is heading towards a global approach uh, in education. Also introduction of Olympiads. Now all schools earlier, it was optional, but most of the schools are making Olympiads compulsory. Uh, we are giving exposure to children on various competitive exams. I think all these are also part of NEP. And uh, uh, let's not just look at the content, uh, uh, like you know how it was some say about 15 years back, I think uh, uh, this is the best uh, way the policy has been taken through. And it's going to be really very, very good for uh, Indian education. And we are going to see a big difference in the next five years. I think uh, that's what I feel about uh, reduction in content. 
And I don't think we should worry about uh, that part. Wonderful, ma'am. So you are firmly in support of this. Let me get yes. across to Dr. Chakraborty. Ma'am, do you agree or do you have a differing view? No, no. I uh, certainly agree with uh, Natarajan, madam. And she rightly said that, you know, whatever we are teaching now, how much, what is the percentage of uh, the content with the child are able to do craps and, you know, apply it to the real life. Uh, conditions or for their jobs or whatever it is. So if we have a content which makes them for future ready for their profession, for their work and which they have a holistic view of uh, the course content, I think that is what is needed. We don't need um, certain things, you know, I mean, it is not uh, that we are moving away from the basics and uh, we are eliminating those which are not required for them. And even uh, uh, like whatever is being taught, if, if the child is uh, able to grasp, uh, uh, I mean, what we have in the new education uh, curriculum, I think uh, that is, uh, and I absolutely agree with uh, Madam Natarajan. Yeah. So both of you are in agreement and my motion stands defeated, which is exactly my job. So thank you so much for doing that. <laughs> uh, Dr. Chakraborty, taking a segue from that, I understand that you as an educator would want this, right? But uh, I think in one of our earlier sessions, somebody had defined our school system beautifully. They said there are three stakeholders, the teacher, the student, and the parent in the presence of certain learning tools. Now talking about society at large, right? Are we ready to accept this? Are we ready for this? Or is there a thought process change that is required? Because I can see parents being very concerned that why is my child's studying pattern or what were he or she is studying so different from what I did growing up? Uh, you know, at first I feel uh, the there is an ecosystem between the three components, you know, the school, the, the teacher, the child and the parents and uh, the parents, what they have done. Um, uh, I, I was reading an article and where they beautifully, uh, it was explained. Uh, I'll just take uh, to explain this. They said, why are uh, like uh, job retainment of people in the companies are less nowadays? You know? They leave the job, they hop to new jobs. Uh, they are not very much uh, happy, so they will leave uh, the jobs. But it did not previously happen to the previous generations. So rightly said, the first generation, his grandfather, they wanted, okay, I have a stable job so that, you know, my child goes to a school, have education, the second generation comes in, they have good, you know, and then they try to have a good house in place so that they live really comfortable. So the next generation, when they say that my father has a car, my father has a, a house. Uh, so I am more now, okay, if I don't like this job, I hop to a new job or, or this. So what I uh, mean to say that there are differences. What we started in our school life, uh, that was uh, that should have been uh, like uh, to get a job when I grow up or I pass out from my college or university. Now, whatever we are teaching the children now, it is for their future. Now, for us, we did not know what is coding. Even if I'm a, I'm a uh, parent to my child who, who is a daughter uh, in the seventh standard. So if now she's learning coding, but I in my, you know, uh, I never learned coding. I, I, it is new to me, but I should not resist the change which is coming because the change is need, needed to make them global citizen. Previously, uh, we did not have this thought. So I feel that the parent should not object to the child. It might uh, understand or it might look like like my child is on the computers or online teaching is happening. Maybe they are not doing too much. See, uh, before the COVID, what happened, even we were very much, you know, the child should not be on mobile. The child should not take my uh, laptop and do things. And now we are, you know, the prices are skyrocketing of the laptops and the uh, devices because everyone has, if you have a you have two children, you have to give them two mobiles because their classes are happening uh, at different times, you know. And uh, then, uh, so they are skyrocketing. So what uh, we have to change the mindset, you know, we have to have a broader mindset because we uh, cannot see ourselves, our children as they are now. We have to prepare them for uh, 20, uh, 30, 20, 20, 35, you know, when they pass out. So I think the, child, the parents should not object to the changes in the curriculum to what the 
you know because school or the education system is best to understand the need of the child i think the ecosystem should be very hand holding you know, instead of uh, you know saying why my child should learn this or that we do it because there are so many developments cognitive development motor development uh, they develop their different uh, uh, intellectual capacities emotional they, we have not my parents have not uh, uh, known about what was they knew iq they did not know what is eq but now if you have a iq and if you don't have a eq uh, uh, you don't stand anywhere now eq should be higher to succeed than your iq so i think uh, the parents should not uh, i know there should be hand holding in the ecosystem that is what wonderful ma'am wonderful ma'am uh, dr uh, mrs natarajan ma'am i will take a segue from what uh, uh, chakra dr chakravarti said right now and uh, what she what she gave the example of the family right the father has you know put the family to a certain social level and then the next level takes off from there so would this wouldn't this be a problem of the digital divide or would this actually create a level playing field for students from different backgrounds um uh, uh, yes definitely because uh, uh, yeah of course this drastic change in all systems nowadays so we are heading towards inclusive education if you see in the school system uh, we are heading towards inclusive education and uh, i think uh, at at this point of time um, we should have an open mind and in fact i would like to i just make a, made a note of um, what our first speaker said uh, he was saying that uh, whether ambani's son and uh, an ordinary person ordinary person's son will study in the same school so that kind of thought uh, i don't think uh, at this point of time we think, in fact in in our Uh, you know if we see our uh, olden days the gurukul system where uh, everybody was same and the prince would come to the same uh, uh, teacher uh, as well as uh, another probably an ordinary person son so they were all together uh, so education i think uh, does not see any level or does not categorize any child and with the introduction of this rte and inclusive education concept i think everybody has uh, equal importance as far as education is concerned and definitely yes there will be a small difference in the way it is taken like you know even when we take admissions under rte or something we ask the parent uh, whether they will be able to support the child at home because as far as school is concerned for us all children are same their iq is same so and teacher is same so definitely we will be able to impart uh, the knowledge to the children and with multiple intelligence strategies which we follow in school with uh, children with multiple intelligences uh, so i don't think uh, from a school's point of view we have any problem but uh, when it comes to at home uh, when it comes to the family there will be a small difference uh, in terms of the support from family for a child who comes from uh, probably uh, you know a background where it is not conducive for the child to take up this kind of a curriculum but otherwise i think um, as far as nep is concerned uh, the the play field is good i think the level of the play field is is good and we have to encourage this and we have to be very progressive i think we should give an opportunity for children as uh, many of the speakers discussed i think at uh, at the early uh, education stage is where children are not getting uh, the right standard of education that is when this difference comes and then they continue with the same thing i think at that stage if we are able to give uh, the base for the child i think all children will be on the same platform there is no difference there is no difference i think uh, we should be able to uh, take it positively and work on those children if we could help them and bring up uh, bring those children up i think that's that's a great thing we are doing for education wonderful ma'am so despite all my attempts i have not been able to turn the two of you away from the policies claim that this is better uh, dr chakraborty i'll come with you for one last question that is uh, you have been talking about coding and technology yes uh, where do you see the role of technology in general not just in learning technology but technology as an enabler of education in you know enforcing this 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 rule uh Uh, i will uh, keep because you know uh, we have a cyber lab 
uh, in the uh, DPS Greater Ranchi School. Uh, and when uh, four years back, uh, we had started with the hacking classes, you know. So uh, parents typically they came. Uh, this is in Bihar and Charkhand. They told me uh, that my child is not hacker. So we are not making a hacker. We are teaching the ethical hacking. Ethical hacking is teaching. I am just uh, you know relating to it. Uh, then uh, we told the parents it is ethical. Uh, no, that uh, and uh, then the cyber lab was created. We have so uh, the technology we. It has a very important role in five plus three plus three plus four system of education, which I strongly believe, because here uh, through technology we are making the children as creator. But I say this coding, for example, coding. I never knew about coding, but when these children are taking coding classes, they're making their own apps. You can understand uh, the uh, uh, you know uh, the. Uh, that kind of uh, satisfaction and learning these children are having now they are becoming creators. Previously, we were using so many apps. The children use the government has banned so many apps, but uh, they, they were only users. They were not the makers. Now, for making India, making India the future India, we have to uh, uh, use these children as makers. So, for makers, we have to enable technology. Second thing, what I'm talking about, I talked in my previous uh, talk was about flip learning. For example, we have online classes on a subject. For example, uh, I take a uh, subject of my for aspiration. So, if I have an online class uh, on that or online videos, the child learns in the classroom. Flip classroom is just the opposite of classroom. Uh, normal classroom teaching where they do the learning at uh, their own pace at home because in the class when I teach respiration one child may understand it very properly and other child may take time to learn so but when they learn it or when they understand it through various uh, you know uh, videos available e-learning at home they learn at their own pace and when they come back to school, uh, they, it becomes easier for them to understand, to apply, uh, and to use that uh, to have a better learning outcomes. So the e-learning is very, very important. And I think with the COVID has taught us, made us everyone, either the teacher, the principal, the students, the parents, every stakeholder is very tech savvy. Now, uh, I feel that intervening of teachers or, uh, you know, uh, will be only through the online <laughs> webinars. We won't even call them to the school to come and give uh, interviews, you know. So technology is very necessary. Technology has to be in place at all the levels, at the five years, three, three, and four. At all levels, the technology has to have very important. Because in uh, 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 with e-learning only, it 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 uh, will make the children's learning more holistic. Uh, so technology, if we cannot do away with technology, and we cannot do away with e-learning, as Mr. Achin also said of digital library. Obviously, now if Metzer, I think, or Metzer, I'm not very uh, clear about the pronunciation. We have lot many books to read. So now, when I when I read in the class, uh, my IQ may not be as high as the next child IQ. So when I do a, a um, customized learning at my play, own pace, then my learning becomes more uh, um, uh, substantial, more uh, you know, uh, yielding of results. So technology has to be in place, and for that the uh, the NEP that uh, has also introduced uh, technical technology as uh, uh, the main you know of this five plus three plus three system plus four system of education ma'am i'm going to take this opportunity to do a little bit of self-promotion i hope you will pardon me for that uh, what you said right now was at the very core of the notebook thought when we started out because as you know notebook has videos that are accessible both from the school as well as from home so school the teacher gets access to the same videos when they're taking online and offline classes they're using these videos to kind of introduce a topic but later the child at home has the same videos on a smartphone or a laptop or whatever. Yes. And they can watch it as many times as they want to. Yeah. So it helps, as you said, in the pace of learning and the students are coming to class prepared. Yes, very the important. Sent... Yeah, because IQ is not safe for every one in the child. My learning may be faster than the, my uh, peer learning or their, my, it may be slower. So what happens now in 
the present post, uh, not post COVID, the pre COVID, what happened is some child did good result, they learned more, they understood more, because the child, uh, the teacher in the classroom has to cater to minimum of 40 students. And 40 students for 40 minutes, it only takes, uh, you can understand how much attention the teacher can give to a particular child. But when, uh, uh, like, it comes to, uh, you know, uh, learning through e learning, the child at home can also go through at his own space, find the difficulties, and come back to school the next day and ask the teacher. So, uh, yes, uh, uh, I have gone through your uh, website and I have uh, gone through your product details. Uh, I would also, in the beginning, I told, I would like to thank you to bring out, uh, you know, uh, you had so many of webinars and you have taken care of all the stakeholders in education and uh, uh, you all are doing a wonderful job. I've gone through your videos and I've seen it's, it's very, very good. You know, they, they are... Uh, catering to customized learning that is what i try to say and that Thank is also so much, that is also i think uh, what i said is flip learning is what you are putting it in place fully one done thank you thank you thank you so much ma'am yeah uh, well this has been a fantastic discussion thank you both so so much thank you subhayu and you. i will now hand you over to achin for the vote of thanks thank you so much for sparing your time for this achin thank over you. to you it was our pleasure. So I think uh, really, really wonderful discussion. Uh, Bharat sir, Aruna, Aruna ma'am, and Natarajan ma'am. I really and sincerely thank all three of you for your time. Bharat sir, thank you again for a, for a great start that you gave us. And very nicely explained uh, the holistic objective of the policy. I think it was uh, very well explained. And also you raised some very uh, fundamental and pertinent questions. Now coming to the panel discussion, one thing that I really liked is the fact that I see so much of uh, positivity, enthusiasm among our esteemed educators and implementation of the policy as has been discussed on all forums, various forums, I guess equal participation, enthusiastic participation of all stakeholders is very, very important. And there's no doubt about it that educators play a very, very important role. So it's, I'm really happy to see the kind of enthusiasm and the kind of uh, progressive attitude, practical, rational thinking that we saw today. And some great takeaway for our esteemed audience as well. Really, uh, uh, I guess one very important point was raised by esteemed panelists, and I completely agree with that, that learning during foundation years, formative years, the entire concept of the ECC that has been built in, you know, earlier, what was happening was that a large section of our students who did not get this opportunity were lagging behind. So there was a difference from the inception and that difference continued forever, you know, even during higher classes. I think that's a very, very pertinent observation, very correct observation, no doubt about it. And at least there is intent now, there is constructive positive thinking now in terms of recognizing the problem because unless until we recognize the problem, we accept the problem. We cannot never solve it, right? So at least I, I appreciate the fact that the problem has been recognize in no uncertain terms and we're discussing about a solution and the policy as we discussed not only not only lays down a broad framework but also discusses each and every aspect of implementation it is really interesting uh, really interesting to hear about uh, the incident on ethical hacking you know uh, uh, these are uh, these are uh, incidents which really gives us a very practical perspective of of you know, the importance and due to the challenges that our esteemed educators handle. So that is why I always say the role of teachers in our education system is so, so important. Of course, parents are also important stakeholders, but the role of teachers can never be undermined. And with coming to technology, which was discussed at length, you know, there's no doubt about it that technology has a very, 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 very important role. And I really, a lot has been discussed about, uh, a lot has been discussed about aspects like uh, 
body shaming in in adult world but very less has been discussed about peer pressure or or intellectual shaming so it's at times i think it's completely correct that every child has a unique learning curve and education of every child is equally important because i believe everyone has talent right so once we give them space we nurture them and we help them prosper and blossom at their own pace of course they all do wonders and as a country we will be able to reap the democratic dividend that we look forward to as one of the most younger youngest and vibrant nations on the face of the planet and that's what all of us look forward to and technology here undoubtedly has a great role to play in terms of ensuring that children are able to learn at their own pace so that they can go through a particular content at their own pace understand and come back so i guess some very interesting takeaways i i sincerely thank all of you for being with us today evening i thank st members of audience for their support as always and i'm sure the discussion has been value adding and enlightening for all of us thank you we look forward to having you in our future sessions thank you thank, thank you and goodbye thank you thank you thank you thank you